from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Georgia Dorn, and I'm the Chief of the Hispanic Division. It is a great pleasure to welcome Franklin Knight to the Library of Congress. He is a professor emeritus at Johns Hopkins University, and he has written many, many books on Cuba, on Latin America, on Brazil. He's a famous lecturer, and he's also on the board of the Handbook of Latin American Studies, for which we owe him a deep depth of gratitude. I would like ask you to please um, close all your, um, oh, you. your e iPads and uh, electronic uh, conveyances. Franklin. Take off your phone, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I must start with an apology. When I was invited, I had the illusion that this would be one of my traditional lectures on such a splendid, elevating subject. <laughs> that is to say, it would be accompanied by appropriate samples all through the delivery. Well, that's the, why I'm apologizing. We couldn't do that. But maybe we can come back and arrange something at the Christmas party where we will have uh, something. <coughs> what I want to do is very simple. And actually, in the first two slides, this one and the next, you have the lecture. So you can, since we, are, we have no samples, you know what I'm going to say. <coughs> you can fall asleep if the chair is comfortable or you can leave quietly. <laughs> I usually say that to look at rum, you look at rum by the numbers. And in fact, number one is that rum is the distilled alcohol from the sugar cane. And two, there are only two ways that rum is made. The first is to make it directly from the juice of the sugar cane, uh, uh, which is how you get white rum. That's uh, mostly done. Today, that method is employed exclusively by, by the French and presumably by the Guatemalans. <laughs> <laughs> All the producers of uh, rum in the world, and it goes under different names as we will see uh, shortly, <coughs> produce it from molasses, which is a byproduct of producing sugar. Uh, there are three types of rum, <clears throat> despite what the marketers are trying to put in. There is white rum, 80% of the rum consumed is white rum, and all rum begins as white rum because it's a distilled spirit, just like any distilled <coughs> spirit will do. So when you talk about white rum, you're talking about sugarcane alcohol. And the reason one never wastes time talking about that is that there are really no subtle qualities in white sugarcane alcohol. It's stronger or it's weaker, and it blends like the other things. When I give a lecture on this, we start with this, and I say, don't drink it. Just put your finger in it, put it on the tongue, so that you get to know what sugarcane alcohol really tastes like. <coughs> what is more, uh, what is preferable for people who like to indulge is regular colored rum, called gold rum sometimes. And that's usually put in casks, white oak casks, and aged from one to four, five, or six years. That's called batch rum. And that's the second largest component of rum, because it's cheaper, of course. The third group is what's called aged rum, or añejo, or premium rums. That must be aged a minimum of six years, usually seven or more, up to 100. And it's blended, just like whiskey. So where you get your qualitative distinction, mainly, is in this third category of rum, the premium blended rums. And again, when I go on to talk about it, I will tell you that recently, the market has been assaulted by all sorts of premium rums claiming to be 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, years old and it's all made over a weekend. But you can find that out. And I'll tell you the secret of how you find a genuine aged rum from one of these weekend uh, uh, rums. There are four characteristics that connoisseurs look for in assessing rum. 
And they're very simple. The first is the color. It should have this nice color, and I'll come back to talk about this a little. And that's why it's always suspicious to buy expensive premium rums which are not in a clear bottle. You have to establish a reputation before you can do that, such as Pampero Aniversario or Zacapa from Guatemala. Those have the distinction, well, <sighs> Zacapa, we don't know. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But they have the reputation that their rums are good enough, that people will believe them even if they're wrapped in leather. <clears throat> the second is a bouquet. That's really very important. White oak gives a peculiar bouquet to aged rums. And that can be blended, complicated, and ameliorated by whatever special additive that's put in to make the rum suave or gentle. In the case of Zacapa, we know, of course, it's sherry. In the case of something like uh, Royal Crown from Trinidad, it's Angostura bitters. In the case of Jamaica Appleton Estate Special, the rum of singular distinction, the rum by which all rums are judged, it's all spice and some other things. So there's a secret ingredient. And the bouquet will always stay if the rum is aged in white oak, because that's the basis of the bouquet. If it's infused with any sort of thing, if you open the bottle for a short time, the bouquet disappears, and you know you have been defrauded. Not an uncommon experience. The third is the smoothness. Good rums are smooth. And a lot of these bouquet rums, because they are forced over a weekend or so, are not smooth. They're a little harsh. And you, again, will feel that, which is why the sampling of rums is an important part of the discussion of rums. And I like to say that the fourth and final one is equally important. There should be no harsh aftertaste. After all, when you open the bottle, you should be encouraged to finish the bottle. And if it has this kick, you're not going to be encouraged to do that. You're going to blend it with something else. So let's start at the very beginning. How do you make consumable alcohol? There are three ways. I'm giving you all these mathematical things. One, two, three. The first, of course, the oldest way is fermentation. You leave most things out, even the sugar cane, it will ferment. That's how we got grapes fermenting, and wine became the first distilled, oh, sorry, uh, alcoholic beverage consumed widely in all wide growing areas. The second is after the discovery of fire, is brewing, boiling the stuff. Creates ales, beers, filthy stuff, uh, but good. And the third, which became popular in the 12th century, actually, third, beginning of the 13th century, with the Fourth Crusade, was sugarcane alcohol. Now, a lot of books on rum will tell you that rum is a West Indian invention. That's not true. A lot of other books will tell you that rum grew out of the Levantine Mediterranean, out of Lebanon and Syria. And that's partly true. But Marco Polo, in 1224, writes that he tasted a wine made from the sugarcane in China. So we know that since the beaker, the instrument of distillation, is of Chinese origin, and that the beakers 9,000 years old have been discovered, we know that the Chinese were distilling all sorts of stuff, mainly rice, but, but also sugarcane. Uh, as an aside, I will tell you <coughs> that the sugar cane comes from, and I'm going to sort of go over that part, comes from Indonesia, domesticated in Indonesia, went through China to India, and then came to the Middle East. And in fact, as late as the 15th century, in most of the Ottoman Empire, sugar was called Indian salt. And in fact, this is when the coffee, which is a beverage taken in the Arabic countries with salt, became blended with milk and Indian salt, which is sugar. You can still get that confection in Vienna today. So uh, these rums are uh, the basis, uh, uh, these uh, sugar canes, or uh, different types of sugar cane, are the basis for distilling rum. Here we have some types of sugar cane. These are uh, exactly what the sugar cane looks like. And 
the, these containers will have the juice in the old primitive forms. If you go to Madeira, you will still see some of those. Uh, this is the mill, <coughs> old rotary mill. Uh, this is a, an improvement made in the middle of the 15th century in Sicily. So for a long time, it was called the Sicilian mill, a double roller or a triple roller. This is the improved Americanized version. That's an American triple roller made in West Point, New York. Both of these are from the old Cuban sugar estates. Uh, not working now, obviously. Uh, these are the pots. You can see that they would boil it in the open. And when the sugar did not crystallize, then you got the raw material for your distillation product. So if you want to call it rum, or rum as the French called it, they were the first to do it. Or you can call it, as the Brazilians do, cassacha, guardiente de caña, or rum. That is a Brazilian uh, cassacha bottle. Some people would recognize that. I would love to have the challenge of drinking that dry. But that would be a little uh, challenging, I think. Uh, I retired so that I could do sampling lectures like these, but the opportunities have not been frequent. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, some of these exclusive rums can be very expensive. Uh, that's not a very good picture, but this is from the Rum Museum in Port of Spain, Trinidad. And this is a special uh, rum that was made or blended, uh, which was sold for almost a quarter million dollars per bottle. Um, I asked them to let me sample it because I have some credentials, but they wouldn't let me do it for good reason, I suppose. <clears throat> Uh, these are the white oak casks that rums are blended in. And on that display, you can see that most of the rums are actually var variations of white rums. And they wouldn't make much distinction. There is uh, some uh, colored rum there, but none of this in this batch would be a premium rum. That is to say, aged over uh, seven years or so, or blended. Although they did tell me, this is from Worthy Park Estate, Jamaica. And they just went into the rum business a few years ago, which is why most of their rums are still white rums. Uh, this is the major white rum they sell, rum bar rum. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> but since rum is a blend, it doesn't really matter. You're going to put water in it or juice in it or milk in it or uh, coffee or something. But they said by 2018, they will have uh, um, colored gold rum and then in the... 2020s, they will have premium rums. So as I mentioned, 80% of all rums, uh, white rum. And earlier in the beginning of rum in the new world, because rum traveled with sugar, it's, as I said, a byproduct, it only became a premium product. That is to say, people would specifically make rum in the 18th century, and we'll come to that. So that a lot of sugarcane growers in the 18th century, including the estates and Pedro, Alejandrino, where uh, Simon Bolivar died, did not make sugar. There are 5,000 acres of sugarcane made only alcohol, distilled alcohol. But it was carried in casks like these, and you can see again the relationship to the whole European distillation. All distilled spirits tended to be put in casks like that after it became popular in the 15th and 14th, late 14th and early 15th centuries. And in fact, if you do the history of any type of distilled alcohol, that's when it becomes a commercial product. Um, this is the Appleton Estate Special. Uh, they don't have their highest brand there, uh, which is the Blue Label, a 21-year-old. Uh, it's the rum that opened the store window in 2012 at Harrods. The only rum displayed at 300 pounds per bottle. I wouldn't buy it, but I did taste it, and it was very smooth, absolutely divine. <laughs> I've been hinting to all my friends that in my retirement, that might be a good thing to give to me to keep me indoors <laughs> in the winter. Uh, so uh, how did rum come to the new world? Well, it came uh, in the long uh, journey from the... Mediterranean through southern Spain to the Atlantic Islands. Now, it, uh, sugar was not an important product in Europe for the simple reason that sugar was derived from honey and other types of, uh, of, uh, of, of um, 
products and was a minor, actually. It, it was uh, not a consumer popular item. That's a sort of luxury. Until it got to about Madeira. And the reason it became important in Madeira, which was one of the major producers along with the Canary Islands, was that when the wine industry moved from the mainland of Portugal onto the islands, Madeira decided, because it had the growing uh, characteristics of Porto, to ship port wine back to Portugal. Well, the people in Porto would not agree to this. So the Madeirans did one up in them. They simply blended it with distilled alcohol, called it Madeira, varied it, and it took to the market with vengeance. Still a good product. This happens to be wine uh, sugarcane fields, which do both sugar, and I'll just go through them quickly because sugarcane fields look the same. The first was Cuba, the second was Jamaica, this is Brazil. What you do get in variation is the is extent. For example, it's dying out now in Cuba, but if you go from Jamaica, or if you go from Madeira, where a uh, sugarcane estate is about the size of this room, to Jamaica, where it's about three, 400 acres, to Cuba, where it's about three, 4,000 acres, then you go to Brazil, where it's about 30,000, 40,000 acres, you can see the production of scale. But the big difference today is that sugar is not as important as it used to be, nor is rum. And so most of the sugarcane uh, growing is done for making ethanol, which of course goes into blend with gasoline or to be used as a substitute for gasoline. So how did rum move from being a marginal byproduct, as it were, to be mainstream? Ah, you can blame that again on the pirates. They know a good thing when they find it. And they found that out. Between about 1650 and 1720, the age of piracy. And what they did was to capture, when they went on land, not just bullion, gold, silver, slaves, uh, sugar, coffee, tobacco, but also rum. And they didn't resell the rum in most cases. They consumed it. Well, about the beginning of the 18th century, when we have these large wars and European countries are establishing peace beyond the line, Admiral Edward Vernon, after whom Washington's estate Mount Vernon is named, was short of the ales that they supplied to their sailors. And of course, one of the big problems until the 18th century was how to neutralize the scurvy attacks among men at sea for a very long time. So they used a lot of things. Mainly they used citric acid, citrus juices. Uh, uh, they even tried unboiled eggs until they found that some of them were probably not the best things after several weeks or months at sea. <laughs> and they hit upon rum. Well, Vernon noticed that pirates never seemed to have scurvy and they always seem to be bolder than they should. <laughs> so beginning in 1739, during the War of Jenkins Air, he ordered that all sailors and soldiers on his fleet, and his fleet included at the time Lawrence Washington, the older sickly brother of George Washington, who owned that little estate that later became Mount Vernon. It wasn't as impressive as George made it, but he owned it. And he was very impressed by this. I think not by the behavior of Vernon, but by the daily ration of rum. Because this is what Vernon said at the time. It should be cut with water, but never blended so much that when taken, will not encourage a rabbit to bite the head off a bulldog. <laughs> so there we get it, the, the grog. And it's called grog, old grog, because Vernon always went around uh, the, the, his uh, uh, ships wearing a grogum coat. So they called him, there goes old grog. And so his order of ration was called old grog. It's blended with uh, uh, citric juice, uh, lime juice, and water. And we still make grog today, although we boil it. And you put in some spices, and it's a marvelous thing. 
One of the big pioneers in popularizing it was a pirate called Henry Morgan, an indentured worker who came out to Jamaica and ended up his life as lieutenant governor of Jamaica and had the decency to die just before his main spot, Port Royal, disappeared in an earthquake. His timing was always impeccable. <laughs> Ask the Spaniards about that. After Drake, he is the other one. Is that and that is the Captain Morgan, but the rum, unfortunately, is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's what we call airport rum. You know, it's a type of thing uh, that you find in airports, and no serious drinker takes it seriously. <laughs> I have never had more than the first taste, but I have been at this since my infancy, <laughs> and I'm still hopeful that I will uh, continue to be in good shape based on this. I won't read through all of this, but what it says is uh, Juan Anula in 1735 talking about this practice that they had found um, in Cartagena uh, on the Colombian coast, where the officers drank uh, distinct beverages, brandy and uh, uh, wines, and the lower classes drank a product extracted from the sugarcane, aguardiente de caña, which is white rum, and also that he was beginning to say it seemed that they benefited from drinking this at 11 o'clock every day. It was good for the appetite. Well, if you're drunk at midday, it must be a good day, <laughs> which is why when I give these lectures, nobody ever complains, because by the time I'm finished, they're in an elevated state of you. Uh, here we have the sort of marketing labeling and the competition of rum, which we could go in for a long time. This is Havana Club, and you have two left. On the left-hand side is the, why it's called the Authentic Havana Club, made by Cubans. And on the right is Bacardi's Havana Club. It used to own uh, the label for Havana Club. It lost it or gave it up, and it's allowed to be sold legally in the United States. Now there is a recent court ruling that since uh, President, President Obama went to Cuba, that Cubans may, or Pernod Ricard, their vendors, may sell Havana Club when the embargo is dropped in the United States. But uh, Bacardi and Cuba, the Cuban government and then Cuban government and Pernod Ricard have been fighting this case since 1970. So it's not likely to be settled in our lifetime. Um, you have a lot of rums, the important ones I talked about, you know, Bacardi, Pampero Aniversaria, Mount Gay of Barbados, one of the oldest continuously produced uh, rum uh, distillers in, in, in the world, or J. Ray and Evie of Jamaica. They respect conventions and labels. That is to say, you can actually, because these are uh, legitimate concerns and who have set the standards and uh, follow the conventions, but then you have on the market a lot of Well, it says it for itself. <laughs> uh, I, I am sure that some pop uh, politicians will say that's a locker room type of rum. <laughs> but you also get the case of Zacapa. Now, Zacapa is a good rum. They, they've just bought out Butran. And they used to sell a rum, which was in the, the left-hand side. You can't read it, I think, but it says... 23 years old. And they have a 25-year-old and a 30-year-old, and I couldn't for the life of me find what was different between the 23-year-old, the 25-year-old, and the 30-year-old. I thought it was the same rum. And somebody, <laughs> you, you shouldn't fire people when you're doing something wrong. <laughs> somebody who was fired from the company pointed out that that ain't 23 years old at all. So they were forced, in fact, to retract the label because it violated the convention of rum. When you label a rum by years, it means that that is the youngest rum in the batch, blended. So a 23-year-old rum can have a 50-year-old rum, but it cannot be called 50-year-old. It can only be called 23, the lowest. And if it has 7, 10, 15, and 20, the same thing goes. So Zacapa cleverly... They have now taken the wrapper off the bottle, but they call the, the rum, and you might be able to, no, you can't see it there. Uh, we should be able to get that. 
Solera 23, <laughs> merely indicating the technique of production, which is to say they put it in sherry cast, take it 2,000 feet. So they say above sea level, I haven't actually physically, physically gone to the plant, and they rack it like sherry is in the sun. So you get that nice, smooth, manifestly detectable sherry taste when you take Zacapa. Now, Zacapa has a 30-year-old rum, which I will say is very smooth and very good. So, the developing for the taste of rum started from the Navy, and anything sailors do at sea, they will do worse on land. So naturally, they took their habits, and they had the sort of substantiation that, you know, Admiral Vernon approves of this. And by the way, the rum ration that Vernon started in 1739 was a standard issue until 1970 in the British Navy. So it endured. And uh, everyone, including Edward Long, the famous historian, would say that if Vernon says it's good, it must be good. And then the second approval came from none other than Benjamin Franklin. Never saw anything new that he didn't like. And this was new. And this was not only likable, it was lovable. And I will go on to give some proof. Long, of course, says how you have to drink it, and that this, the latter part of it I'm trying to go through because uh, I want to have some questions. But there will be a copy online, so you can easily go back and read these stuff if you want to. But what he says that even when you drink rum in excess, it's good for you. <laughs> and I like that. Anybody who will make that sort of declaration is my friend. <laughs> uh, but rum became really very important in the early American colonies, or the later M American colonies, just before independence, because it became the second largest employer of labor. And in fact, it generated much of the wealth of the Northeast at the time. And the consumption in, in the uh, British North America was tremendous, five times what it was in the British Isles, where people were easily captured because they were unsteady on their feet. <laughs> Rum helped in the conquest of the United States. And in fact, even George Washington admitted that when he uh, signed the naval Armament Act in 1794, in which he said, there shall also be allowed one pint of distilled spirits per day, or in lieu thereof, one quart of beer per day per person. That's my type of man. <laughs> That's what I call hefty drinking. But look what we have from another of the fathers of the country, Thomas Jefferson's wine cellar. Now, you know that Jefferson was himself a winemaker. Curiously enough, he lists none of the Monticello wines in his wine cellar, which led me to believe that they didn't meet his standards, having lived in France, so they were for his friends. <laughs> I, I know the idea. I used to serve my seminar sherry, but I wouldn't serve them the sherry I drank at home. <laughs> they had to get something a little less uh, for their horses. But, 15 bottles of Madeira, 4 bottles of common Lisbon wine, 54 bottles of cider, and 53% of the wine cellar is 83 bottles of Barbadian rum. Uh, Lawrence, as you know, and George also visited Barbados. Lawrence spent some time in Barbados, got very fond of Mount Gay, and when he came back, the entire Virginia aristocracy were drinking rum, mainly Mount Gay. Uh, later on, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who served some time in Haiti, came back and served Babancourt in the White House. Babancourt is a fine rum, but it's a French rum like Clamont. I'll talk about that. It's a different type of rum if you really like rum. There's no reason why you can't like Clamont, but uh, Babancourt and Clamont pretend to make a cognac. And I always say to my <laughs> French Antillian friends and Haitian friends, when I want a cognac, I buy a cognac. When I want a good rum, I buy a good rum. And one should not confuse them. But to each his taste, and it's a matter of taste. So let me run through a few factoids and rum. I already mentioned the high consumption rate here. 
In 1770, with a population of 1.7 million, British North America consumed 7.5 million gallons of rum, half produced locally, half imported from the Caribbean. I ran through the figures, and it fig I figured that four out of every five persons were either women or children. Women were doing all the work, children were supposed to be in school, yet British North Americans averaged 4.2 gallons of rum per year. How did they ever win the War of Independence? <laughs> because they were certainly more unsteady than the British. British consumption at that time was less than one gallon per person. In 1770, British North America had 18 sugar refineries, 118 distilleries, 51 in Massachusetts. No wonder they threw the tea into the sea. These guys were unsteady on their feet. It was not necessarily a political statement. It was a physical fact. So they go. And one, by 1740 already, uh, rum was beginning to be, in all the books of the planters in the Caribbean, the second most important cash product that they had. The Ward family in 1703 in Barbados and the Ray and Nevier family in 1749. But when we begin to think of rum, the, the, the thing about the early rum, the 18th century rum, is that it's mainly white rum, or it's rum that's crudely aged in white oak. After time, they found that white oak was the only oak that would give the chemical reaction that makes rum acceptable. But it still had a lot of impurities in it. And the other thing was that a lot of the sailors thought that you could store rum in lead barrels. So it was not surprising that lead poisoning became particularly serious in the 18th and 19th century. Then we become with Facundo Bacardi, who started what we call the modern age of rum making. Bacardi was a Catalan, came to Cuba, where his brother ran the sugar business until uh, 2014. Uh, Sandy destroyed the factory, but until 2014, you could still see the original Bacardi factory in Santiago, uh, Cuba. And what he decided to do was to experiment with it, to see how you could uh, blend these aging rums, which he started. And by 1862, he had come on with a product that was acceptable, despite the fact that the more successful he was, the larger the number of rat bats flew from the distillery. So most Cubans called it rat bat liquor, but it didn't matter to the Bacardi family because the king liked it and gave them a gold medal, and they were on their way. About the same time, the Clement family in Martinique started the same process, and all new rum makers began to do the same uh, scientific aging blending of rums and removing more and more of the impurities that came with the whole process of sugar making. So that's how we got all of these different types of rums, the batch rums, which are the ones from two to about uh, six years, and those tend to be uh, common according to the batch uh, that's made. Uh, I'll sort of skip these because we've talked a little bit about them and go through to the traditions of rum and how one, this is the blue label in the middle, the 21-year-old that I have said, uh, actually, last week, for the first time, I had the pleasure of sampling that in Toronto, Canada, because I have good friends who know my weakness and indulge it. This is the Harrods window uh, uh, in 2012. So here are some uh, a sampling of uh, premium rums. Uh, we'll, I've already talked about that. Uh, said why I don't talk about white rums and all these different, what is ginger rums and coconut rums and all these things that marketers are trying to use to attract a sort of wider audience. Uh, one of the characteristics of rum is that it's really very versatile. Anything you blend with rum, rum improves. <laughs> so it's good at the beginning and it's get better with whatever you do. And the three ways of drinking it is if you're going to buy a good rum and you really want to know how good it is, you really have to have it neat. You must have it uh, straight and you must have it in the sort of cognac, a glass with a, uh, things you can rub. It's really very good. You can drink it 
at all seasons of the year. This is what's so marvelous about it. Straight in the winter, blended in the summer, and somewhere in between in the spring and the fall. Um, well, I won't go into the airport varieties of rum. And we'll now start about the, the connoisseurship of rum. You look at the four characteristics I said, color, bouquet, smoothness, and the absence of a harsh aftertaste. And the real color, although you can get a darker rum, some people like Goslin's, Bermudans especially, which is a very, very dark rum. But again, Goslin's is not a superior rum on its own because it's supposed to be the basis for dark and stormy, mixing it with ginger beer which gives it that really kicking nice, not a mule kick, but a nice stimulating urge. The real color, though, of good uh, premium rums should be honey-like. It's sort of smooth, not too dark, not too light. And that was, again, why I said that if you wrap the bottle, you can't do that before you buy the product, and that is an important part of it. The bouquet these lectures must be given with samples because it's important that when I talk about bouquet, you get it. It is a really unique individualistic bouquet because if you are spending a lot of time indulging in this habit, you can, from the bouquet, determine some of the rums. You can, uh, Havana Club, for example, or uh, Santiago, which is the old Matusalén, which they lost the labor for, the copyright mo uh, trademark for, uh, is blended with molasses. So every five years in the aging process, they open the cask and they infuse some molasses and they turn it, you, 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 rack, you rack it. And so you can, in Havana Club, detect the molasses. And also in the bouquet, the molasses come through. And a good premium rum, or sh let me backtrack and personalize it since all alcohol consumption has a personal base. Everyone has a favorite uh, beer. When I came to this country, I couldn't understand how they could drink that stuff, having come from a country that produced really good beer. But then I realized it's marketing, it's laws. So we improved the beer where I was. Um, and uh, it's a question of the reaction with your palate. So I might have a favorite, and you might have another favorite, and we're both right. It's very good. But bouquet is a really good test of authenticity, because if you open a bottle of rum, one of the characteristics of truly aged rum is that it maintains its bouquet almost indefinitely, almost because it's going to absorb uh, moisture from the air. Meanwhile, artificial rums, these, uh, these uh, weekend one-week deals that are now cropping up all over uh, will lose their bouquet because it's an artificial infusion. If you put it in, it will come out, and it'll fade quickly. Some smooth examples. Dorley is the most popular Barbadian rum, but mine happens to, my favorite happens to be Coxpur, V-S-O-R, very special old rum. It's a rum that's so smooth you will forget you're drinking it. Or El Dorado. There's Havana Club, and there's some Examples, the, the one, uh, this is Pampero Centenario, Aniversario, sorry, from Venezuela, a really good rum, uh, much better than Hacienda 1796, which <laughs> started making rum in 1996, but calls itself 1796. <laughs> um, Royal Oak is a, it used to be a Venezuela rum. It came from Angostura in Venezuela. In the Venezuelan Revolution of 1898, it moved to Trinidad, makes Angostura bitter. Some of you might know it, and uh, it's one of the things they put in it. Uh, two good, this is the Venezuelan uh, uh, Pampero in, in the leather jacket, and the Barcelo and Brugal from the Dominican Republic, also some really good rums. Uh, there is Coxpur, but uh, on the, the very left is my favorite. When I need to celebrate or relieve my depression, I grab a bottle of that. Very good. My son and I would yield a retreat, or when Barcelona loses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, some more of the rums that you will have. This is uh, Puerto Rican rum, Dancu, on the left. Very, very good. Hard to get sometimes on the market. And uh, there is an ordinary Puerto Rican rum, too, which uh, Barrelito, three-star. There are a number, I, I don't have the time to go into it, a number of ordinary rums which have all the characteristics of premium rums at about one-third of the price. Uh, on, this was a display of Zacapa that ran for about four months in the Miami airport. I happened to use the Miami airport uh, a lot. And so I was responsible for most of the sampling there for four months. Um, no rough aftertaste. Good rums invite repetition. They should go down smoothly, very, very smoothly. And uh, one of the characteristics of this is that you cannot get smoothness if the alcohol content is above uh, 86 proof. You will get some of these 88, 90, 92. You should be suspicious about that. The perfect proofage for suavity is between 80 and 86. Uh, that means the half of the proofage is the amount, the percentage of alcohol in. So an 80 uh, proof rum is 40% alcohol. I think that if you drink things that are 120, 160 proof, you're committing suicide. There's no way the liver can handle that sort of things. But most of the people who drink that type of rum are either alcoholics or they drink it with water. And the other thing, finally, is that rums need no special language like winemakers. You know, it tastes of fresh mowed hay. You won't taste of fresh mowed hay, go eat hay. <laughs> That's why we never talk about tasting rums. We talk about sampling rums. Because you know you go to the wine market and you bring your cheese and you bring your bread and you get your thing and you swish it and you do all this sort of ritual and then you spit it out. Nah, that's not for the rum guy. You drink and drink until you hear the click and you are oblivious of what is around you. Rums are sampled, not tasted. So here is a testimony. I don't know, do I have time to, yes, to read. I don't know if you can read it, because you can read it. I love this. <laughs> there are 7,800 labels of rum in the world, at least. That's the last time I looked at the rum list. Made in 181 countries. And this guy is waxing poetic over one rum, which came from Anguilla, a tiny island that produces no sugar. But that's not against it. Most places that produce rum do not grow sugar cane. So it's not surprising. Today, most rum, including, I suspect, most of the Caribbean rums, a lot of the North American rums, are from alcohol. Brazil is the major supplier, South Africa, Australia, Guyana. All the others uh, tend to buy the stock or buy the sugar cane. So can I move on? Yes, that's what he is. I hate to tell him, because this is about four or five years old, that pirate is no longer bottled in Anguilla. It's bottled in Guyana. But it's still a good rum. Uh, still an authentic rum. So and, uh, here I'm just running through some of the countries. And again, you can go online when this is up on the Library of Congress web and pick your rum. These are both normal batch rums, which are, which, but the batch rums here, like the Barrilito from Puerto Rico, three stars, are rums which measure up, or Flor de Caña. The ordinary Flor de Caña rum is a remarkable rum, and yet it's not a premium rum. Uh, Flor de Caña makes a 12 and 14 year old rum, which is, well, if Christianity gave that instead of milk and honey, they would have a lot more affiliates around the world. Uh, here, are, uh, another list. I just thought I would give you a, a choice if you want to get it. But I, I, I don't select or recommend the best rum. And I have said that I won't do that until somebody pays me to say that. Then you will get my number one. But usually, I give a range of good rums. If you find a rum that you like, that's a good rum. Buy it and drink it. If it has all the qualities as a premium rum that I have indicated, 
then you're home for good. And they can come from anywhere you want. I haven't really got into the Australian and South African rums yet. I've had a few. They're really, really good. Uh, some that I have tasted, but I need to get a range of it. And then there is a bi 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 bibliography for those of you who thought that I was just speaking from elevated stimulation. <laughs> but I actually did some reading as well as drinking. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can we get some lights so uh, I can see? Yes. Uh, me? Yeah, yeah, okay. you're number one. I wanted to say that, first of all, I had the pleasure of sampling rum with Joyce Spence. Oh, you can't get any better. Joyce, <laughs> for those of you, Joyce Spence was the first female blender in a major rum maker in the world. She was J. Ray and Nephew in Jamaica, Appleton Estate Special. And when she was appointed, I remember it well. There was doom and gloom from all quarters of the globe where people appreciated good rums. They say, this is the end of a good label. She is the one that developed the blue label, 21-year-old, and some others. Uh, there are only two female blends. She has a PhD in chemistry. So she's, she's, she has the credentials. Most of the other people are sniffing and snorting. <laughs> Sorry, I take that back. No political reference here, please. <laughs> but... but um, uh, a lot of it is, you know, the father-to-son tradition of declaring the sort of quality. Yes, but you were going to say something else. Yeah, so mm -hmm. my question is, mm -hmm. even though, well, she, she did give me a, a nice bottle of rum, mm -hmm. like the DX or something. Yes, like very special. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We sat under the trees of Devon House and mm -hmm. sampled rum. She said, never put anything in your rum except a little coconut water or ginger beer, but never a Cuba Libre. Well, yeah, well, I, I, I will agree with that. I myself think that Coca-Cola is supposed to be a rust remover. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I, I, don't, I don't drink Cuba Libre, but a mojito. Now that's something else. Uh, in fact, I walk around with my own recipe for making mojito. And in Cuba, when, you know, I will say to someone, uh, this is not very good, and they say, oh, <laughs> It's a Cuban thing. And then I whip out my little night's special mojito recipe. They say, yeah, El Sabe, El Sabe. He knows. He knows. <laughs> and they my want it. Is, yep. Mm -hmm. With all that good, wonderful rum in Jamaica, why do people prefer the Ray and Nephew white rum? It's in everybody's house. Yeah, but that's true everywhere that rum is consumed. As I mentioned, 80% of the rum, go to Australia, white rum is the rum consumed. And I think mainly because a little bit is the addictive quality. They're not drinking it for the qualities we are finding out in batch rums and premium rums. They're drinking it for the alcohol. It's like smoking cigarettes for the nicotine. Mm -hmm. And so some of them will blend it. But you know, with white rum, you can only get it stronger or weaker. There is no subtlety. What develops in the aging is subtlety in the batch ordinary rums, and more so in the premium rums, because something new is introduced. Uh, in fact, they're even now making some sort of bourbon and, and, and putting sherry in it uh, to make it gentle. Yes? Um, can you talk a little bit about rum and sugar in this country? Because rum seems to have been singled out as the devil drink. <laughs> well, it was called, yes, it was called Kill Devil from the 16th century. Richard Ligon writes about it. And it was the most popular drink in the United States until 1913. So that all the things that we now identify with bourbon or white lightning, or with, uh, uh, Southern Comfort, for example, was made with rum. And since rum was the most popular distilled alcohol consumed, it got the fire. Now, in 1913, between 1913 and 19. Uh, 30, and uh, prohibition was repealed, uh, a lot of underground uh, operations took flight. And rum never recovered after that. Uh, first of all, American bourbon whiskey developed, white lightning and all these poisonous stuff that they, to which we owe NASCAR and other type of things. <laughs> um, uh, Sark, which advertised itself a long time as a Scotch whiskey. It was made in the Bahamas and Bermuda never came from Scotland, never had nothing Scottish in it at all. 
or later on uh, we get whiskies made in Panama and so on. Uh, but uh, the temperance movement really did uh, affect rum, but not alcohol consumption. So beers came up, uh, although they tried, you know, for a number of years until recently. In a lot of states, you couldn't have beers which were stronger than 4% alcohol. 3% was the average. You couldn't have wines which were more than 11% alcohol. Today, wines are up to 17% alcohol. They've been creeping up. And beers up to 8% alcohol. But a good beer is usually about 6%. Yeah. Yes? I have a question that kind of follows up on this earlier question about uh, what the locals drink. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a time when I don't think Goslings was even on the market in the U.S. Oh, okay. I was just going to say Gosling has been around for a long Bermuda. time. Yes, in Bermuda, yes. So that's what Dark and stormy. Drink. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what just ordinary folks drink mm -hmm. in large quantities. Oh, yes. But it's not a white rum. It's no. not the stuff that comes straight out of the sill. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm kind of suspecting, based on what you're saying today, that it's not dark because it's been aged in wood, it's is it dark because something's been added into it? Yeah, it's caramel. It's burnt sugar okay. in goslings. And it's aged not necessarily, especially goslings, not in necessarily in oak cast because you're putting in the caramel to give it the color. You can put it in plastic and steel um, the same way that, you know, in Argentina until the 1990s, they aged their red wines. <laughs> then, of course, when the Chileans told them, you know, if you put it in Ocas, it's better. <laughs> they caught on. Uh, but that's the No, uh, I think um, the, the, the rum that the buccaneers and pirates and others were drinking was white rum. Uh, it was ac only accidentally that they found that putting it, in, aging it, which was accidental too, uh, improved it. And the casks they had were thrown away casks from wines or ales or, or things like that. And as I said, several of them paid the price for using <laughs> yes, the in, <laughs> improper <laughs> uh, containers. So is this practice of adding in stuff like caramel, is that what you were referring to as the, the weekend aging? Yeah, well, it's yes. And in fact, there, there's a movement trying to legitimize it, saying that you shouldn't be against caramel coloring because it is, the caramel is the sugar, and sugar comes from the sugar cane. But of course, you can get caramel from all sorts of other things as well. But more and more, they're just coloring it artificially. And they, if you can infuse it with atoms of a certain things, you can trick the palate into believing that it's actually the same chemical things. But it breaks down, almost invariably, when you artificially constitute the color and the bouquet and things, they just fall out. Well, there are lots of agu aguardiente they can. It's sugar cane alcohol versus fruit alcohol. So, but the basic alcohol is the same whether it's from the sugar cane or you, apples or grain or whatever else they do. Well, when I was a teenager, we tried to make, I went to a boarding school, we tried to make alcohol in the chemistry lab from chips, not knowing it was very poisonous. Luckily, it blew up before we could sample it. So, <laughs> so we were saved. Later we learned that that was a very dangerous thing to do because had we succeeded and we were close to it, uh, <laughs> it would be lethal because it's not, a, it's not a, a ethanol alcohol, which is the type of alcohol that is consumable, yes. Yes? Um, I'm not a drinker of rum yet. A pity. I know, oh. <laughs> uh, but I have a weak head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to get a good rum, how much would it cost in the United States? Oh, there's a great wine shop at the foot of Wisconsin Avenue and M Street, and you can get a good rum there for 20 bucks. You can get a good premium rum for 30 bucks. Now, they have a lot for 50 and so on. But no, you can get a good ordinary rum. You look for Barilitos Tres Estrellas. Or you look for the Flor de Caña, I think they have both, and I think you're talking about 18 to 22 bucks for that. 
and it's marvelous and smooth. It has all the characteristics I talk about at one third of the price. That's it. I thank you for your attention. And again, I apologize that you have to take my word for it. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.